Welcome, everybody. This is Kim Coleman-Madsen, and we are hosting the Broadband Emerging Technologies Working Group. Uh, we actually did a two-part series this month on satellite communications for public safety panel, and you're joining us for part two today. Reminder, today is an extended session from um, 12 to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time Zone. Uh, we hope you can stay for all of it. If not, uh, there will be resources on the presentations available after. So next slide. And so just a quick reminder, last week uh, we had a panel of um, great presentations from Night Sky in Marsat and Hughes talking about new features and functionality and where the industry is heading, and we're pleased today to have the second panel focus on newer entrants into the field and how these technologies might differ from traditional systems, including talking about the different types of um, orbiting Earth-orbiting satellites as well. Pleased to introduce Gary Minetti, who will be facilitating this second panel. So, Gary, I'll turn it over to you and um, have you introduce the uh, presenters, and then I believe we're going to, as last time, hold questions for the end. So. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kim, and welcome, everybody. So, uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Gary Minetti. I'm the founder of a consulting and professional engineering company called Minetti & Associates. We've done some market research, and we pulled together some uh, industry experts uh, last week and this week to educate this audience on the advances that have made in satellite telecommunications. And specifically, we're trying to address what's been done in several vertical markets, but still that, that have uh, you know, real value to the public safety community. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. Next slide. So yeah, so I'm going to be giving a market overview. I'm also going to be uh, sharing some information uh, based on what I learned on last week's call too. So for those of you that saw my presentation last week, some of the slides are the same, but we've made some some uh, changes and added some additional information. We're uh, pleased to have representation from SDS Government Solutions, Mr. Tim Deaver, who's the VP of Corporate Development. So, uh, Tim, welcome. We also have representation from uh, Mr. Chris Buck, Senior Director for Strategy for the Americas for GD SACCOM Technologies. And uh, we have Russ, who is an aerospace engineer who helps me at Minetti & Associates. He also has his own consulting firm. So, uh, Russ has got a lot of experience uh, in this space as an aerospace engineer. And while he can get pretty deep, I think what he's going to focus on now are some things outside of the telecom components, like imaging and uh, sensing and other things that are advances that will really help public safety. And then we'll go into a question and answer period. So next slide, please. So a little bit on the market. Now, these numbers are a little bit dated, but nonetheless, and I'm sure there's new numbers for 2016, but the satellite market is, is large. Globally, it's $335 billion with a B. Of that, you know, the commercial segment is really dominant, right, with 77% um, uh, representing commercial and 23% government, even with the billions of dollars that are sp spent by the U.S. federal government and other government markets. And the market covers several different areas, uh, including uh, satellite ground systems, commercial launch, human space flight, and navigation and receivers. So, um, so this means there's a lot of money being spent and a lot of innovations being made that can benefit public safety. Next slide. So let's take a look at some of the market dynamics uh, as it relates to the market research that we did. So if you look at what's going on in the commercial satellite market, let's look across several different arenas. One is DOD has been interested and continues to be interested in using more commercial satellite services. This has released RFIs. They believe there's cost savings, there's speed and time to market that can be improved by using commercial services. And, you know, the, service, the, the satellites that are being launched, some of them as large as school buses in geosynchronous orbit for various U.S. and other government's uh, missions are, uh, are very costly, right, and, and hard to maintain, very much needed, but there's, they come with some advantages and some, clearly some disadvantages. So commercial space looks very interesting to them. There's a new dynamic called Space 2.0, and we're going to cover that more on the next slide, but you know, consider it like the evolution of the Internet when we went from Web 1.0 to Web 2.0. Space 2.0 will really drive innovation in communications, surveillance, and other areas. And, and few, there's a fueling of more private sector investment and opportunity. Uh, and, again, that will benefit public safety. And we'll get into more specific examples as we go through today's uh, session. Enterprise ground system is a term that was generated and created by General Heighton uh, when he was running uh, U.S. Cyber Command, um, Space Command, I should say, 
And the military is looking to knock down a lot of stovepipe proprietary government-provided ground solutions, providing more interoperability, more interconnectivity, more resilience, and, 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 and you know, this looking at the commercial space operations and launch partners and integrators is very interesting to them and represents uh, time to market and cost savings and benefits as well. Better economics for launch with companies like SpaceX and uh, uh, Blue Origin. Better economics uh, in terms of satellite uh, analytics that are that are being done. A lot of investment there. Regulatory changes that allow you to get to 30 centimeter spatial resolution, uh, which was a, there was an example of that actually shown on the other page. And then um, and, and global reach, right? Because of these these satellites that are being deployed will be able to reach billions of underserved uh, people on on the planet. Next slide. So if you look at uh, Space 2.0 Explained, the national security community looks at it from a perspective of U.S., China, uh, where the only, uh, and, and Russia were the only dominant space regimes. Now there's a plethora of other countries with, with good missions and not so good missions, right? Resiliency is an important part of Space 2.0, uh, especially against cyber attacks. Commercial space access in Space 2.0 are embracing a growing importance for commercial assets for surveillance and mission critical communications as well as launch and operations and maintenance the consumer demand for space manufactured products especially pharmaceuticals is becoming you know uh, obvious in this new space 2.0 paradigm and then the commercial and space investment community is waking up right there's a lot of investment we'll talk about that a little bit later but you know, traditionally, launch, remote sensing, and communications, less traditional is space manufacturing, space tourism, uh, space debris cleanup, and others. So there's a whole new set of uh, technologies and market dynamics that are driving these new market segments. And the market entrance with deep pockets, well, here's some of them, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, SoftBank, who's not mentioned on here. Um, and uh, they have a conference once a year that they, they talk about all of these different things and bring together some of the players and investors. Next slide. So here's a list. You know, one of the things that's going on in geosynchronous orbit are high throughput satellites. Some of these satellites will drive throughput capacities of 100 gigabits upwards to 300 gigabits. This is, I'm not going to review all of this for you. This is more of a lead behind, but it shows you, you know, who's deploying, when they're deploying, where they're deploying. So you can see there's a lot going on to provide broadband services from these satellites that could be very beneficial to public safety for data. Next slide. And here's some of the new broadband startup and startup ventures, right? So O3B, who was off by themselves, I should say O3B had high profile investors because they're solely part of SES and Tim will talk more about that later on. But you know, it started with Google and Hong Kong Shanghai Bank and others, including SoftBank. Uh, they, O3B, which is now part of SDS, not to steal Tim's thunder, but they provide high-capacity fiber-like backhaul to mobile operators. Those high fiber-like backhaul capabilities and services can be brought to bear to serve public safety as well. OneWeb, similar in that, you know, this is uh, SDS with O3B as a Middle Earth orbiting satellite constellation. OneWeb is a LEO, like uh, Iridium is a LEO, low Earth orbiting. Uh, OneWeb's developing a lot of satellites, right? 650 to 900, 125 kilogram small sats. Um, you know, these differences are, if you look at the altitudes, um, you know, the, the higher geosynchronous orbits, that's like 26,000 miles. The others are 12,000 miles at MEO, or excuse me, uh, 1,200 miles, and then somewhere below that for LEOs. Uh, SpaceX, Elon Musk, right? He's, he wants to, he wants a mission to colonize Mars. Uh, Sp SpaceX uh, submitted to, to international regulators. They want to launch 4,000 satellites. So this means a lot of coverage, and this means a lot of capabilities and capacity for uh, for public safety. And Blue Origin, right, with their owner, Jeff Bezos, who happens to own Amazon, he wants to go back to the moon. And he's seeking repeatability, as is SpaceX and launch vehicles, to get things up into space quicker and cheaper. Next slide. And, you know, we learned some things. Actually, some of this was from all of the panelists uh, that were, excuse me, the panelists, yes, that were on last week. We talked a little bit. We got some questions about imp improving, uh, improvements in managing satellite delay characteristics. Well, you know, geostationary, 26,000 miles up, 500 milliseconds, 250 milliseconds up, 200 
50 milliseconds down. And I can remember back in 2000 when IP started to proliferate all these networks, create a lot of problems, right? But to do this, to manage that, some of the some of the things that have been done are MEOs and LEOs, which have less delays. Architects uh, kind of looked at fixing things at the ap application layer, like uh, doing things for uh, streaming applications, using buffering and TCP IP or TCP acceleration. So that this problem of uh, delay is, is really very minimal or negligible, to say the least. Next slide. And these are some of the dominant uh, uh, players, right? We're fortunate to have uh, the largest uh, company here, uh, SCS, on the call today to talk about their capabilities. And um, interesting also is that there's awful lot to make up the other segment uh, in green. These are numbers from the fixed satellite services, not mobile. Some of the folks provide both mobile satellite terminals and fixed satellite terminals. These numbers reflect just the fixed market. Next slide. And this is, you know, the traffic and where the revenue comes from, right? So not surprisingly, it's video. 61% or 66% is video and then made up by the other segments here. And the estimated services revenue for 2017 is large. It's 12, almost $12.5 billion, right? So public safety can take advantage of these, uh, these investments and these types of services. Next slide. And kind of wrapping up on this slide is, um, you know, one of the things that is nice to have around a satellite terminal like sh that's shown on the left is an LTE bubble, maybe two LTE bubbles meshed together to bring services to communities. Like, look, look, look what's going on in Puerto Rico and the other Caribbean islands and all that's happened in Houston and in Florida. It's terrible, right? So, you know, the challenge in all of these is gaining access to the spectrum. So what are some of your options, other than having the FCC and emergency communications allow you to, uh, to, to communicate and use the spectrum? You can have a commercial agreement with a mobile network operator, use FirstNet Band 14 with AT&T. Satellite operator can work with a roaming hub provider. You can take advantage of newly available citizens broadband radio service, CBRS that's coming out later this year. Um, MultiFire, which is unlicensed uh, LTE spectrum. Well, you know, so if those are the options, what's the solution? The solution is either a public or private LTE network, depending on which of those routes you take. And the benefits are clear. It's building out the LTE coverage uh, to enable communications in the scenario shown below. Even on the right, if you need an aerial solution, technologies are available to support that and extend those broadband services off the broadband satellites. So... Uh, that's it. I'm just, I think one slide just to kind of close with my contact information. And uh, with no further ado, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Tim Deaver. So and thanks for the introduction, Gary, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, present some background information on some of the capabilities going on. I'm going to talk a little bit about SCS in particular, and then we'll get into just some of the generic uh, changes we're seeing in the satellite world. Um, I've been doing this for a few decades, and, and this the changes in the last five years and the promises uh, for further change in the next five years is just astonishing and what we're going to be able to do from space and the services that are going to be able to be delivered by some of the folks. Yeah, so a little bit of history of uh, SCS Government Solutions. Uh, we've been in business a little over 40 years, gone through uh, different name changes as the consolidations and acquisitions within the uh, space industry have occurred. We actually started out back in the RC Americom days, uh, then GE Americom, and then we were – GE Americom was purchased by SES, um, and they're based out of Luxembourg. Uh, so to continue to do business with the U.S. government, we had to create a separate U.S. government entity called American Government Services, uh, and a couple other revolutions as we went through and finally became who we are today with SES Government Solutions, basically focused on providing uh, satellite communications end-to-end -end services to the United States government, uh, wherever they operate around the globe. Next slide, please. So the next slide shows the SCS Satellite Constellation. As uh, Gary mentioned, once we did the purchase of O3B MEO satellites, we became the largest satellite operator in the world. We have 53 geosynchronous satellites at 36 different orbital locations operating in the standard uh, CKU and KA bands. Uh, so if you could advance one more slide, 
or maybe my screen's just good. There we go. Uh, Twelve medium Earth to orbit satellites. So these satellites, and I'll get into a little bit more detail here in a little bit, are at 8,000 kilometers above the Earth, so about one fourth the distance to geo. Um, so Gary mentioned the latency to geo being 500 milliseconds round trip. Uh, we're about 150, 140 milliseconds round trip. And what that enables is a lot of your enterprise networks capabilities that we see today on networks and so forth like that. And I'll get into some more of those details later. Um, we have an extensive ground network that ties us all together, re full redundant systems between our teleports. Um, at any given time, we're moving about 57 gigabits of per second of traffic around. We also have a, uh, another uh, project we entered in with the Luxembourg government with the public-private partnership. Um, for those familiar with the, the U.S. military, they have a satellite system called WGS, or Wide Band Global System, that operates in the MIL-K and X-Band. And through our partnership with Luxembourg government, we will be launching a commercial uh, satellite that has the military spectrum on it. So the users are limited to governments and, and, and institutions uh, by the I-2 uh, requirements. Uh, but it's fully compatible with the U.S. WGS uh, system as we go forward. Next slide, please. Gary mentioned one of the things that the uh, innovations happening in the uh, satellite world is what's called high throughput satellites. Uh, we have our standard satellites today um, where we kind of think of able to get one megabit per second through one megahertz of spectrum. Um, and then as we go forward, we're, we're quadrupling that to, and sometimes even getting up to eight to 10 megabits per second through a megahertz. So what that ends up doing for the end user is it ends up lowering the cost per megabit. And then as we get into the SES MEO uh, with the O3B constellation, we're actually talking about our goal, our capability now, if uh, depending on the size of the antennas the user uses, we're actually seeing prices near $500 uh, dollars per megabit. And as we introduce our next generation fleet, which just went under contract with Boeing, uh, we're hoping to be able to cut that uh, significantly down again, and it'll be basically by like by fiber uh, capabilities. So on the top of the slide, on the top right, it kind of shows the current KU capability that's pretty standard. You got with your 1.2 meter VSAT terminal, establish your service or your satellite news gathering truck, and you you get about 10 megabits per second to 30 megabits per second on a transponder, and that's kind of the, the limit you have. But the nice thing about it is it's fairly global coverage as long you know if you're on the earth. Um and I kind of just showed the KU band coverage there for our fleet. If you cover the C band then you get true global coverage. So if you're in the maritime market, we're providing quite a bit of maritime service today to the ships that are deploying down in the Caribbean for emergency relief functions. Um they don't draw a whole lot today. Um the the Navy doesn't spoil their troops and sailors like the Royal Caribbean does where we're using them with O three B and being able to provide fiber-like capabilities for folks on the, the Royal Caribbean ships. So the MEO HTS capability, um, we talk about it's available now. Um, some of the LEO constellations that uh, Gary mentioned are you know, a few years off, 2021-type uh, operational capability. Um, we're delivering low latency, 150 milliseconds, and, and over 1.2 gigabit per second to customers in the uh, in the desert areas as well as we're actually servicing a NOAA weather station in the Pacific that had always uh, trouble getting reliable fiber, and that's at 10 megabits per second. So it's very scalable um, and uh, provides great capability there. And then the global geo high throughput capability is shown in the lower right. Um, this is really being this technology advancement is really being driven by the in-flight entertainment industry. So if any of you have been on a plane lately and connected through Wi-Fi, thank you. Uh, uh, it's, you, a lot of the CONUS capabilities uses our satellites over the U.S. Um, a lot of that is still uh, using the traditional wideband capability. Uh, our first HTS satellite for over the U.S. was launched back in May. But using another technology advance, advancement that the satellite manufacturer is using, it is an electric orbit raising satellite, so it takes about six months to get to geosynchronous instead of six days. But the advantages with that is for the same size satellite, same launch vehicle, we're getting almost three times the payload capacity. Uh, so significant improvements. That's what's enabling the HTS satellites. That's what's enabling the cost per megabit to come down and driving other uh, features going forward, too. 
the nice thing about the HTS uh, satellites is each one of the, the beams is about 200 to 300 kilometers wide. So Gary mentioned a little bit about resiliency before. Um, so if you look at the wide beam coverage, if anybody in that wide beam is inadvertently pointing at you and, re and radiating on the same frequency, you get a lot of interference, rather if it's intentional or unintentional. Um, you go to the high throughput satellite capability where it's only two to 300 kilometers, that person has to be within that same footprint you are in. And then we have some flexibility of being able to tune the frequencies within those spot beams too if there's an interfering signal in there. So we'll, we'll be able to provide much uh, better uh, service to our customers in there um, and uh, also make the system a little bit more resilient, taking a step towards uh, survivability in, in case of uh, hostile actions. The next slide, please, which would be slide 22. Um, some background on the, the O3B constellation. So we've gone from uh, satellites that are typically, you know, maybe five gigabit per second for a geo, big geo satellite Earth coverage. Now with the O3B constellation, 10 users beam per satellite, two gateway beams, and on each user beam, um, we're getting throughputs of 1.2 gigabit per second within that 700 kilometer wide beam. So same resiliency I talked about with the HTS, it's a much smaller beam, you gotta be within that 700 kilometer beam. We don't see a whole lot of interference uh, with the O3B constellation because the satellites are always moving and we're non-geostationary Earth orbit, so they're not pointing at geo, so we're not getting the, the you know, congestion or any other interference from any other satellite operators. We do have to worry about um, some of the countries that are introducing 5G in the 28 gigahertz area because that's the frequency we use, so we have to do the frequency coordination there to make sure there's no uh, transmit antennas close to us. And then um, each customer beam is considered configured with 216 megahertz, where standard geo transponder is 36 megahertz, so we're considerably bigger than that. We're close to the Earth. We're using advanced technologies, and that's how we're able to get out of the 216 megahertz, 1.2 gigabits per second. Um, so with the 10 user beams per satellite, we're getting you know 12, minimum of 12 gigabit per second out of each satellite. <clears throat> and that's kind of what we're seeing in the entire Mio, Geo, uh, Mio and Leo as the other satellites come on board. The advances in technology is just what happens in the, in the, the two three year time period is just amazing. Um, so it drives lower costs lower latency, and the big thing about latency is we talk about cloud-based applications, access, database accesses. Um, you know, if you look at some of the LEO constellations up there now, they claim they can do uh, full motion video streaming, uh, but that's only good if you're watching it on an iPhone. Um, we've done eight simultaneous full motion video, high-definition streaming videos on a 72-inch television. So. You could tell if it was uh, being down converted, so just to get to the pipe, size of the pipe, and the pipes were able to handle all the data. That really changes some of the uh, capabilities, especially where we focus on the U.S. government. I also talked to about the Royal Caribbean. They're a big uh, consumer of this, and uh, they're able to provide, you know, the gigabit or better to their each one of their ships in the Caribbean. Um, to where they were used to doing 10 megabits per second. So significant increase for the capability there. I know, uh, you know, the parents here don't go uh, on, the, on the cruise to play games, but it helps keep the kids entertained sometimes. Next slide. Um, we just introduced this in Paris at the beginning of the month. It's what we call O3B Empower. It's taking everything we talked about on the previous slide and either multiplying it by 10 to 25, while cutting the cost by one tenth, um, it's amazing capability. We're going to be connect, be able to connect any user to anybody. 15 megahertz. The concept of having to come back to a gateway goes away. Um, each satellite has a capability of multiple terabit capacities. Um, the satellites are, are not even quite six foot tall through some advances in technology that um, Boeing's bringing to the table. So it gives us that ultimate flexibility to, to really cover and, and, and be there. The one advantage of being at MEO is um, at 8,000 kilometers, I get pretty good line of sight. So I don't have a lot of dead spots out over the ocean where I'm not connected to a gateway or to another user. Um, so we kind of say we're, we're at the right altitude where we're kind of 100% productive all the time. 
Um, another thing we're putting on the satellite here that very few other operators are going to have is the NSA level encryption and decryption. So it meets the um, CNSSP 12 security requirements that is mandated by the U.S. government and DOD for national security missions. Um, with the phased array antennas we're going to have on the satellite, obviously, if we're picking up any interference of any kind, we can shift the beam around, we can change the shape, or we'll have full frequency flexibility to actually completely change the frequencies as we need to. Um, so I wanted to kind of stop there and then let the other guys go through and then be available for any questions you might have. But the technology advancements we're seeing in the satellites, you can see, you know, O3B MEO is just a five-year-old constellation and where we're going to be in five years. That's the types of advances we're seeing um, in both the satellite side and obviously a lot of what we do is enabled by the ground. So um, Chris's message coming up first on what they can do on the ground with these capabilities is pretty amazing too. Oh, wow, Tim, thanks. That was great. I mean, just to, what you guys have done, and I, the first I've heard of Empower, uh, it looks like a great solution, and, you know, not having to uh, – it looks like you're routing in space, I think, is, is what I'm seeing by the diagram, which is, you know, going to save a lot of up and down of the data, too. So, great job. Thank you. Um, I guess we'll move on to our next presenter now, Chris Buck from General Dynamics. Thank you, Gary. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for uh, letting me speak today. Um, as Gary told you, I do have the business uh, development responsibility for the SATCOM product within General Dynamics. been in the industry for 30-some-odd years, 22 of that specifically, the last 22 years of that specifically for ground-based SATCOM hardware. So expert or not, I'm not sure, but I sure have been around for a long time. So uh, Gary asked me to talk a little bit about changes with ground terminals, and that's what I like to do today. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't do a plug for our organization. So that's what this first slide is, basically talking about General Dynamics purchased us uh, back in uh, 2004. Uh, we are the largest manufacturer of SATCOM-based ground products in the world. We were in 2004, we are today, and that's basically driven by the fact that uh, we develop, or we develop, and we build. We are the OEM for antennas, controllers, and RF electronics. Basically, everything you need for a SATCOM ground terminal, all the way up to the IF, IF interface for the modems. Uh, so we do everything from 60 centimeters all the way up to 34 meters in size for antennas, and everything and anything in between. So we've been around for a long time. So that's my shameless plug. Uh, Please move on to the next slide, and then I'll talk about uh, ground terminals in specific. So Tim kind of talked a little bit about high throughput satellites, as did Gary. I mean, uh, as did uh, um, Gary. I wanted to take the opportunity just to talk about specifically high throughput satellites and what they've done to the ground market and what they're going to do with the ground market in the next couple of years. Uh, they are obviously uh, stronger satellites. You have increased capacity on these, stronger, more powerful satellites in space, which uh, means that they're driving the size of the terminals on the ground to being smaller. And we're seeing this not only in the user terminals being smaller, but even the uh, infrastructure guys, the, the SESs, the Intelsat, uh, you know, all of the providers of the satellites in space, they're able to use smaller terminals for their ground infrastructure. So what does that mean? That means less capital expense for those guys, uh, which also helps in bringing down the uh, bandwidth costs that you, the user, at the end of the day, pay for. Uh, there's an argument uh, always been that uh, SATCOM was expensive and that it was kind of the last resort. Uh, you used it in areas that just had no other communication uh, at all. I think you're going to see that changing, and Tim made uh, made mention of that. You know, is it possibly going to become primary communications in some instances? Is it competing with fiber? And, you know, in the future, I think that might be the case. So keep that in mind when you're thinking SATCOM. It's no longer, you know, the old SATCOM uh, that used to be out there that was expensive and used only in certain situations. All right, so what happens with the higher power, uh, with the higher beam width? It, you have... 
higher uh, power coverage beams, uh, the wider area coverage, but you also have the spot beams that Tim mentioned, and those are even stronger. So we're able to get to user terminals uh, in the range of the 60 centimeters to one meter in size and still get throughput that's needed to transmit uh, video. Uh, this has not been seen in the past and with the geostationary satellites of old. You had to have either a much larger satellite or a higher power amplifier in order to push that type of throughput. Uh, now we're able to do that with, uh, you can see the one, in fact, on the uh, kind of the center right there. There's a 60 centimeter terminal that we built. And it, uh, it can perform, you know, for a small echelon that goes out of uh, a few users perfectly and fits uh, right into what the first responders are probably looking at for the smaller uh, enclaves that go out. For command centers, uh, we're seeing antenna sizes being sold in the 1.2 meter to 2.4. Again, I'll talk about that uh, a little later down, a little later down the road on another slide. Uh, KU and KA is the most uh, used frequencies and continues to be and will be in the future. I mean, KU has been in the past, but with these high throughput satellites being launched with the KA capacity, we're seeing. A lot of users switch over to that. With KA being higher frequency, they're able to push through uh, more bits with uh, uh, at KA than they were at KU. Uh, so, and we'll talk a little bit about ease of use. Go ahead with the next slide. Gary had asked me to talk about uh, Leo and Mio and how that is impacting what's happening in the ground market. Uh, the key selling point, the biggest driver. Uh, to Leo Mio will always be and continue to be at this point in time lower bandwidth costs. Make it uh, much more affordable for the user. Uh, there are some other benefits there. You know, are, do you have better voice quality? You know, are you able to use enhanced applications uh, better with Leo Mio? Uh, you know, the answer to that is typically yes. Uh, but what are the drawbacks? And the drawbacks uh, are really the ground terminals for the user and the cost of the ground terminals. Uh, you can see on the right side there, that is actually a 1.8 meter antenna that we build for O3B, one of their type 2 terminals that they use. Uh, and you can see they're a little more complex than what you find in the geo stationary type satellites. The control, there's you know, increased controls needed to track the satellites. As you can imagine, LEO and MEO, they're not in a stationary orbit. So you've got to be able to pick those satellites up as they're coming over the horizon and follow those to the other horizon. And in the meantime, have a second antenna picking up the second terminal rising from the horizon, second satellite rising from the horizon, and be able to hand off from one, one terminal to the other. So that gets a little more complex. And anytime you say complex, that typically means it's more expensive. Uh, so that's something that definitely has to be taken into account. Mechanically, uh, they are constantly moving. Uh, so although, you know, we do have terminals that do have uh, very low failure rates, they are constantly moving. So they require more maintenance than a geotype terminal that you set up and it, it sits on the satellite and doesn't move. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, two terminals. So more cost up front for the user, uh, but, you know, the payback, the benefit is you spend a little more money for the terminals up front, if you're going to use them a lot and you get much lower bandwidth cost at the at the back end. So something that a user has to weigh when he's thinking about Leo Mio versus Geo. Uh, so what's the what's the way around this? And phased array is what everyone is talking about at this point in time. Is that is the savior for Leo Mio for user terminals. And the and the thought there is in phased array antennas you can put multiple beams on one antenna that are software driven. So there's no mechanically move, moving parts uh, and the antennas can sit typically flat type arrays. Uh, so if you have them on vehicles, uh, they're much more lower profile. Uh, the issue is the technology as we've seen it lately, and we've been investigating this and watching the market for quite some time, is it's just not quite there yet. I mean, there's a lot of money being pumped in to uh, the people for uh, IRAD, for different companies. You've got Kymetas and the Phasers and other companies out there that are really looking at this technology. And it will be a key driver, uh, not just necessarily in the uh, first responder space, but obviously in the car market with uh, autonomous vehicles on the horizon. 
those car manufacturers are looking for antennas down in the $100 range to put on their vehicles, and, and no one is there yet. Uh, will they get there? We don't know. It's kind of a wait and see on what happens there. Next slide. Mine's taking a little time to uh, update, so hopefully you can see. Uh, so I want to talk about key advantages of just smaller antennas in general. Uh, there's multiple vendors, uh, multiple products, multiple pr performance uh, that you can get on antennas nowadays in, the, in these smaller uh, antennas. Uh, the military market has really driven change over the last five years and what these antennas look like. Uh, everything is driven specifically by size, weight, and power. Everyone, they want them smaller, they want them lighter, and they want them to use less power. So that's a couple of uh, pictures on the right side of some of our products. Uh, I can talk about a little, little bit of those in just a second. But uh, the key game changer probably in getting those lighter weight terminals was the use of carbon fiber and other composite materials. So all of these smaller antennas now you're seeing are really carbon fiber based to get the weight out. Uh, and it also helps in reduced packaging size. We're seeing antennas now in the 1.2 meter range and below. And I know I mentioned one meter here, but we're, there's ones out there in 1.2 meter that fit in a single transit case that weigh under 70 pounds or even lighter than that. Uh, many of these fit in backpacks and uh, you can take them on airplanes and airline checkable. The one on the top, left that you see is actually a product of ours. It's a 60 centimeter terminal. Actually fits in a backpack. It's all one piece. You pull it out and you can be up on the air in less than uh, a couple of minutes because there's no setup or moving parts that you have to worry with. You flip two ears out on the reflector and you're ready to go. Uh, the other driver of these antennas is, is they're not just antennas anymore. A lot of times what you're buying is you are buying an antenna system so it's coming complete with not only all the electronics built in, but also the modem. Uh, and that one on the top left is a prime example. We have multiple modem cards that fit in a slot on that antenna. So you have a complete system ready to go to the field and can pop up and be ready to use in a matter of minutes. Uh, because of the lower power, that is needed on these antennas now because of the high throughput satellites. So you can use smaller amplifiers that take less power and other things. We're able to run many of these antennas that you see here off of batteries anywhere up to uh, three, four hours. And now you're seeing the military use these with uh, fold out solar panels and they've been running days at some point on these antennas. So that's key for first responders that's going out to the field. If you're not going to be around power or in, a, in an emergency situation where, such as the hurricane right now in Puerto Rico where there is no power or no generator close, we can actually run these off of battery and or solar panels. So that's a big, huge benefit that's come over the last couple of years. And it really has been driven by the fact that with the high throughput satellites, we are able to use smaller amplifiers and still get the throughput that uh, users need. Go on to the next slide, please. So what I showed you in the smaller antennas, again, is what you would see used in typically a, a couple of man or a one-person uh, type enclave. Uh, but what about uh, seeing integrated solutions coming from multiple vendors out there now, including ourselves, of where we're taking anywhere from a 1.2 meter SATCOM terminal uh, up to a 2.4, typically mounted on a uh, vehicle or a trailer. Uh, and these are fully integrated systems that come complete with LTE, Wi-Fi, radios, software to support uh, situational awareness. So these are more for enclaves that's your command centers. Uh, they come in multiple shapes and sizes, as I said. Uh, the key there is you're able to, in the command center, gain the information and using software, take that situational awareness and push that out to the boots on the ground. So I'm sure there's multiple scenarios you could come up with, but if you take a 
a forest fire out in the middle of Idaho somewhere that has no communications. If you have one of these mobile command centers set up with your user terminals, with the guys on LTE or whatever, uh, you're able to push situational awareness of these guys real time. So if the winds change and the fire shifts and you need these guys to uh, see what's going on, you can push a video or still picture to them showing what it is, say, hey, guys, you need to move you know, a quarter mile to the west. So that's the key to these mobile command centers. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys can see the pictures. I'm, I'm not seeing the slide. But if you are, the bottom middle picture is actually a uh, mobile command center that's done by Comprehensive Communications. They're one of our partners that we work with. Uh, they use our SATCOM antenna and our LTE. It shows you a great example of what, uh, what a mobile command center can look like. Yeah, I can see it. Good. We are a partner to uh, AT&T uh, on FirstNet, and so we can offer these type of, uh, you know, the AT&T standard uh, solutions. In fact, we're building a number of the first ones for uh, for them right now. Uh, but we can also do user-defined systems, and again, they can contain anything and everything that's about that you uh, you would want in there for a mobile command center. That's uh, pretty much what I have. Um, I could have talked more about phased array, but really at this point in time, I wanted to talk. We do mainly parabolic, so really wanted to focus in on that. Uh, I can take questions later if there's any on that. But uh, here's my contact information. Please feel free if you have any questions on ground stuff to contact me. Thanks, Chris. That was a great presentation. I mean, it really showed, and, you know, I know you have a much broader portfolio of uh, technology because I'm very familiar with it. and to see how that marries up nicely with uh, what SCS has. And that's why I wanted you two guys on this panel, too, together, because of how you're working together and how working together can also benefit public safety uh, in, in FirstNet. So so with that, uh, we've, we have the pleasure of having an aerospace engineer. Now, Russ, I hope you're not going to get into quantum physics or anything too deep in your talk. No, that's not the plan. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. All right. So I'd like to introduce uh, Russ. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Gary. Uh, thank you, Karen uh, and uh, Don. Uh, thank you uh, to the members of MITSCFIC for uh, spending your, your afternoon or morning with us. Uh, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and really kind of get into the, you know, as, as Chris was talking about, now that you've got this connectivity, what do you do with it? How can you apply it to your operation so that you can provide better services, better situational awareness uh, for not only uh, the first responders out on the field, but also, you know, in every disaster, you've got to feed the dragon back at headquarters somewhere. So having that type of connectivity and having the tools available so that you can understand exactly what is happening as it happens, and in some cases, through harnessing a lot of the stuff that's happening in machine learning and artificial intelligence, you can start doing predictive analysis, uh, analytics of what may happen in the future, and it just provides you a much better situational awareness picture. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, please. All right, so uh, with broadband uh, SATCOM, you get access to weather, geospatial uh, analysis tools. Uh, as as um, Chris was mentioning, uh, in a lot of the developing world, they are jumping right past uh, traditional technologies like copper or fiber uh, or even a public switch telephone network, and they're going straight to wireless. Uh, so uh, that is really uh, pushing the industry to keep pace with that and it provides you guys with fairly uh, good access to technologies that you can utilize. Um, so this is going to be, um, as I said, a very high-level type uh, look at this. The, uh, the key thing in everything I'm going to be talking about today is these are commercial products, commercial services that are available. A lot of them, uh, as a state or local representative, if you work through the federal government and the lead federal agency, be it FEMA or whoever, <clears throat> they may actually cover the, the cost to get access to these services. Uh, so if it's a, uh, an official declared disaster and then you could go through the federal piece of that, and you can get to the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, you can get to the U.S. Northern Command, uh, you can get to several other agencies that are available to provide additional support uh, with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA, 
Uh, they cover a lot of the cost of access to commercial imagery. Uh, so that could be another avenue to get access to these applications. So with this, uh, what I really wanted to focus on is, is looking at how you can use geospatial tools to include imagery, uh, both electropical and synthetic aperture radar, uh, as well as some of the data analytics that are out there that help you make sense of all this. So go to the next slide, please. Okay, so uh, starting with Digital Globe, uh, they've been around for many, many years. Um, they're, they're, they've got the highest resolution uh, of the commercial imagery providers out there. Uh, they basically work with panchromatic, which is your traditional black and white imagery, uh, as well as multispectral imagery, which has the ability to provide color images as well as uh, sense in certain bands within the infrared spectrum. Uh, the nice thing about infrared imagery is it can actually see through clouds and smoke, uh, or some, some clouds, uh, smoke and dust mainly. And that is very beneficial if you are in a, a wildfire response type uh, scenario uh, or there's major fires, uh, structural fires. You can at least get a sense of, of the extent of the damage, where the fire line is, where the winds are pushing it, uh, that type of stuff. And I've got an example of that coming up. Um, wanted to just bring a couple of examples, open data and first look. Uh, both of these uh, are capabilities that are out there right now. Uh, Digital Globe is actively supporting uh, disaster response uh, efforts for hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria, uh, as well. A lot of these, these commercial companies are doing similar things, uh, but they are actually doing this on a no-fee basis. Uh, for those organizations that are involved in those specific uh, disaster scenarios. Uh, with Esri, Esri is one of the largest geospatial analytics companies out there as far as the analytics tools go. Uh, they create something called ArcGIS. That's a mapping geospatial analysis tool, uh, and they do make that available uh, at various levels. Uh, I, I was surprised when my son was a senior in high school he took a geospatial analysis course as a high school class and was given a free copy of ArcGIS to, to be able to utilize. Uh, so with that type of capability, you can really get in and start doing a lot of before and after comparisons. You can start running a lot of different scenarios, a lot of different comparisons, uh, and it really drives home the need or, or the opportunity. Uh, now that you've got this mobile command post that is connected to the world via SATCOM, you can have your geospatial analysts, your disaster response analysts, looking at this information, analyzing it as new information comes in, exploiting it there in the command post to get it to the on-site commander, and then you can push that through the wireless network, either through LTE or Wi-Fi, out into to the field and provide updates. So if we go to the next slide, I'll show you some of the stuff that I'm talking about. So. Uh, with electro-optical and synthetic aperture radar, uh, in the one red image there is false, false color infrared, uh, infrared imagery of a fire scar. Um, I picked this one mostly just so you could see the difference. It's a very stark difference, as you can see in the image. Uh, the dark areas in that image are burned areas uh, from the fire. The healthy um, plant life, the foliage, the he healthy foliage is colored red. And anything that's burned ends up being the, the darkish brown and screen. Uh, so even if there was uh, an active fire and, and smoke covering the scene, you could still see where that fire line is. And uh, if you see an immediate shift, um, you can push that information out to your, uh, your first responders who are dealing with that situation. At the same time, at night, you can be looking for hot spots uh, that you may or may not be able to see. Uh, especially a lot of places in the country, they, uh, they do not have the ability to fly their helicopters at night. Uh, so at nighttime, you really don't have a way to keep track of where the fire is at. Infrared imagery will give you that opportunity. Uh, there's some other things that we did uh, in the U.S. government. Uh, there was something called the commercially hosted infrared payload uh, that actually performed quite nicely for providing broad area uh, support to wildfire detection and tracking. Uh, that's a government program uh, that, again, you could go through FEMA uh, or NORTHCOM to get access to that, those types of capabilities. Uh, 
Uh, following with synthetic aperture radar, this is something that I don't know if a lot of folks in the public safety arena are aware of. Uh, at In the commercial market, uh, most if not all of the available commercial synthetic aperture radar imagery is is foreign. Uh, in case, uh, the example I showed you is a radar sat two image that is uh, owned by uh, MDA and, and and it's a Canadian company. There are German companies, there are other European companies, and they provide the bulk of this commercial imagery. Uh, the U.S. industry is starting to move forward on this. Uh, small set technology has allowed this and has allowed opportunities for U.S. companies to start getting uh, moving forward, and some policy uh, changes have uh, softened some of the um, objections within U.S. government to commercial synthetic aperture radar being available in the U.S. Uh, I point that out because it is a day-night all-weather imaging capability. You can do change detection very readily with it. In this particular image that I showed, uh, this example, you can actually see um, the effluent coming out of a river. You can see how that is happening. So as flooding is, is occurring, as you're trying to see the extent of the flooding, uh, especially if there is too much cloud cover to get a traditional overhead image, you can get that with radar and then bring that into your analysis tool. Uh, so it's a very powerful imaging capability that is available on the market. Uh, it's just not as easily a available as it is uh, as other sources are. If we go to the next image, uh, next slide, please. So with this imagery, you have big data and machine learning. Uh, the, the, this industry is, is taking off um, like like gangbusters right now. Uh, the two examples I showed, or the example that I showed here, is from Digital Globe. Uh, and they basically, they tell the computer to go and highlight where all the water is. And so it is is coloring the water and highlighting the water in the image. And then they say, okay, I want you to show me all the structures that are in the water. And so the computer will actually go out and map. And you can see that in the right image. The computer is mapping where the roads were or are underwater, what structures are uh, impacted by the water. Uh, and you can do that over broad areas. So if you're doing a response in Houston and you're trying to understand exactly where the extent of the floodwaters are and how many structures are impacted so that you can understand how many uh, search and rescue teams you need to deploy to any given geographic area, these types of tools will ha allow you to make a, a faster, more accurate analysis of what's going on. Uh, now, I, I just showed what... Um, um, Digital Globe has using their GBDX platform. There are many, many other companies out there. Uh, GeoSpark is a new company that's utilizing a tool called Blue Glass that was developed by OG Systems. Uh, there are a couple of com other companies out there that do big data analysis algorithms, um, such as Decision Q or Lux uh, or ICG, which runs a tool named Lux called Lux. Uh, these um, programs, what they can do is uh, if you work with them as you get ready for um, disaster, I and mean, when you're doing your disaster preparedness, you can integrate these types of algorithms into your decision center, into your command post, and they will ingest not only imagery, they will ingest social media, they will ingest uh, census data, they will ingest basically any data that you can give it, either structured or unstructured. And then you tell it what it is that you want it to look for, and that the, the algorithm will go out and start making these connections that you and I would not be able to intuitively see, uh, but the, the machine will see it, and the machine will learn from it. Uh, and so, again, as you're trying to make uh, life or death split-second decisions, these tools, these algorithms that are out there will provide you that insight that you're not going to be able to get on your own. Next, please. All right, switching gears from imaging and geospatial type uh, considerations, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about commercial uh, contingency communication, uh, especially for your first net guys and, and, and for SATCOM. If you're somewhere and, and the capability is degraded uh, by environmental factors, uh, if you're in the middle of a wildfire and you get surrounded, uh, the, the fire can actually create enough of a plasma that your VHF or UHF comms may be impacted. Uh, 
Uh, you may have destroyed infrastructure. If there's heavy rains uh, because of a tropical storm or hurricane, all of those can impact your ability to reach your folks. Uh, so if your first responders are not, are not already carrying uh, personal locator beacons, uh, these use a 406 megahertz uh, standard waveform that goes up to uh, a satellite uh, within the NOAA, uh, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, they will receive it, they will geolocate it, and then they will forward that information to a rescue coordination center. So if you do have first responders who do get isolated, a personal locator beacon will allow them to, to give a cry for help. Other, and it's basically once you buy that hardware, uh, that's your sole co uh, cost of the hardware. Uh, there is no subscription fee. Uh, the downside is uh, the, the response time may be hours. Uh, depending on where you are in the country or, or the world. Uh, other alternatives to that are Iridium and Spot. Those are subscription-based systems. I've shown a couple of examples there. That allows you to actually track your first responders as they move around. You can see them uh, on, your, uh, on your map display. <clears throat> you can also provide two-way comms in the form of text messages to them. Uh, the other part of this is an emerging commercial industry that is doing um, the, the ability to detect, geolocate, and map spectrum. Uh, so from a disaster response, one, you can map it out exactly what spectrum do I have available, what do I need to augment with, and then you can also do geolocation of the various uh, first uh, response uh, radios, either the first net radios, the VHF handheld, or these uh, personal locator or search and rescue beacons. Next, please. Next slide. And then finally, wrapping this up, uh, I want to just give you another thought. Um, I'm a, an offshore competitive sailboat racer, and we hang uh, radar reflectors in our rigging so that our sailboats don't get inadvertently run over by big ships out on the open ocean. Uh, pictured is a, an emergency radar reflector made by Davis Maritime. It measures 11 and a half inches in diameter. It folds flat uh, into three panels. Uh, and basically what these things do is the, the corners that you can see will, will capture the radar imagery, imagery or energy and then reflect it right back to the radar's uh, receiver. So out on the open ocean, either a C-band or an X-band radar is sending out pulses. These reflectors reflect the pulse back to the receiver, and then the ship sees you, uh, whereas typically a sailboat is very hard to detect on radar. Uh, this could be uh, another type of signaling device for your first responders who are out in the wild. If they become isolated and they need help, you can take one of these emergency radar reflectors, assemble it, and then put it out in, a, in the net open area, and as you can see in the image in the lower right, <clears throat> those little dots of light, those are the actual radar blooms as seen by a synthetic aperture radar imaging system. Uh, it could be either airborne, it could be radar sat 2, it could be Parastar X. Uh, you would be able to see that little bloom of energy, which if they arrange, if they have multiples of these, say they have three of them and they arrange it in a specific triangular pattern, then you have an indication that, okay, that's not supposed to be there. That's where our team is. You can go and find them. Uh, next slide, I believe, is my final slide. Uh, again, this has been a very fast and furious uh, overview of some of the applications that you can do with from a geospatial perspective, as well as uh, contingency comms and support to search and rescue to find isolated personnel and help get them back. Um, I'm available if you ever have any questions. Just shoot me a line, and I can work you through this. Uh, I have no vested interest in any of these uh, products. Uh, they're just capabilities that I'm familiar with. Uh, I've utilized a lot of this capability during my active duty time in the U.S. military as well as in my commercial life. So, Gary, back over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. Oh, man, this is a good day, I think, for us. We had some three really good presentations. Um, I can count mine as, as a fourth good presentation, but then that, I would be, you know, kind of bragging if I did. So I'm just going to say we had three really good presentations and and Russ you know I do some competitive sailboat racing too or at least I used to and I wish I had a radar deflector on the boat I was on when we did governor's cup because I swear we almost got run over by a tanker <laughs> so uh so look uh thanks again to all the panelists 
So now what we have the opportunity to do, and we've got quite a bit more time than last week, uh, we've got 20 minutes open for question and answer period. So, Dawn, I'm going to hand it over to you and let you open up the lines. Uh, a question for, for the representative, for Chris, from General Dynamics. How does the performance and cost of gimbal-mounted parabolic antennas compare with spherical lens antennas, especially for those on the move? So I'm not very familiar with the, with the spherical. Uh, I can tell you, gimbal-wise, there's a couple of manufacturers out there, and it really depends on the throughput requirements that you're looking for. Um, us, specifically, we build a very uh, high reliability, expensive terminal for the U.S. military that's used in uh, the Army's Win-T program, so it's, it's quite expensive. Uh, but there are others out there, CTEL and some of these others that you've seen on ships, and, and really what's driving the uh, the market is airborne. You know, Tim, Tim mentioned Tim mentioned in his presentation about you know thank you for using uh, the Wi-Fi on airplanes. You know, getting to the point, everyone has device they want to use their uh, their tablets and their phones, no matter where they are, to watch video and or do email and work. So the airborne market is really driving where we're going with any type of on-the-move antennas. Uh, so you're going to see, and again, you know, the question there is, is it phased array or is it parabolic? And that's just uh, that's it's kind of a question in the market right now. Uh, and it, there's two, two camps, and it really just depends on your mission, on what you're looking for. For all the panelists, uh, well, maybe less, maybe not so much for you, but for the, for the, the larger companies, we hear a lot about FirstNet. Uh, now that the contract has been awarded to AT&T. And last I checked, and I know Bill's on the line, it was 20-plus states that have opted in. What role can each of your companies play in support of FIRST? And GD, I know, Chris, that you guys are already on the team, but if you could just speak a little bit to, you know, how you would work in the first in that domain. Yeah, so our first net for GD is being run out of our office in uh, Massachusetts. We were brought on the team specifically to assist AT&T with program management. This uh, was much more like a government program than what AT&T is used to seeing in the commercial world. Uh, so they brought on uh, GD, having expert, obviously, in government type of programs and execution of that. So that's really our prime focus on FirstNet. Okay. But as part of that, we're also an equipment provider. So for the states, municipalities, and others that will be looking at uh, buying equipment. We're working on solutions, obviously, for that as well. Good. And, uh, Tim, how, how would you – I mean, I think I know the answer to this, but let me have you answer. How would you go about as SDS providing uh, services uh, to FirstNet's mission? Well, yeah, so, you know, they use quite a bit of satellite capacity today. So um, on our C-band, KU-band capabilities – and uh, we've been working with them to introduce them to the new technologies of both the HTS and the advantages they can get there, and then the, the obviously the capabilities that come with O3B. And one of the things I didn't mention in O3B that FirstNet really likes is with the low latency, Gary, you mentioned um, the LTE yeah. bubbles um, right. in your presentation. An LTE bubble supported by um, O3B capability gives you 4G um data rates and everything else out in the middle of nowhere without any connectivity, you know. So you take your command truck that uh, Chris showed up, um, and we've, the, we have a prototype, one of those, with an O3B antenna on board, and then a, an antenna for LTE, and it's, it's quick responding for uh, and be able to not just do 10 megahertz, but able to provide, you know, gigabit throughput to, you know, multiple handsets. Oh, that that would be awesome. Great. So, uh, well, thank you. Uh, let's open it up for folks on the call. Any questions from, from the folks participating on the call? And, Gary, I just wanted to throw in to that yeah. response to Russ. I just wanted to throw in really quick that um, when you have that level of connectivity that Tim was just talking about, with the advances that are happening in all of these uh, geospatial analysis tools and machine learning uh, data analytics, a lot of that stuff is being done in a cloud-based type architecture where the, the heavy lifting, uh, the hard processing is, is done back in a, in a server farm. And you don't have to, 
either ship the entire image to them or have to receive the entire image to be able to get the information out of it. So you, you can do all that in the in the cloud, and then they can push you optimized information for the data rates that you have access to. So you're not mm-hmm. sitting there waiting all day for the image to download. You get the information that you need to make the decision and move forward. Right, right. No, that's a good point, Russ. Thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, certainly the technology that we learned about today is, a, is an enabler to do that. Uh, you'd have choke points otherwise with much lower bandwidth services, I would imagine. So, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Gary, uh, Barry Luke, we've, um, Tim was just talking about uh, some mobile handsets, and one of the things that we hear from FirstNet is that in some of the extremely rural and, and frontier areas, that satellite may be the, the solution for the first responders. So, um, so two two cases, which I, I think Tim may have touched on. The first one is you you have a sheriff's deputy who arrives at a house uh, and they leave their vehicle and they go inside the house. Um, and so their their handset inside the house, you know, is not going to be able to establish an LTE connection. But the handset that that they're using inside the house can talk to their vehicle. And there's been this thought that that the sheriff's patrol car, so not not a larger command and control trailer, but the sheriff's patrol car would have satellite connectivity that would allow the patrol car um, to communicate to the satellite and establish the link for the deputy in the house. So, so a question about the the, the the perceived feasibility of that, and and does that work um, uh, if that vehicle is in motion uh, at speeds? Does that impact uh, the ability of a of a vehicle mounted satellite antenna to function? And I know we've heard about some lower form factors for those. I was just curious about those two questions. Yeah, no, good question. So, you know, there's a lot out in the connected world. Uh, connected car capabilities have been discussed about, and Kaimata, which was mentioned by by Chris, is looking at how they basically replace your roof with a flat panel antenna. And um, then you get a fully connected car no matter where you are, it was Cell towers, cell towers was available, but automatically switch over to satellite if uh, you, you were getting the signal levels you needed via cell towers. Um, I don't think that's all that far off. I think just a few years down the road, they're already working with prototypes that do that. And each one of those, you know, um, they can stay connected on an aircraft, so staying connected on a, on a car doing significantly slower speeds um, isn't an issue. Obstructions become an issue if you pull underneath the bridge over over bank or you got uh, a lot of trees in the way. Like if you got uh, direct TV like I do in a, in a house that's got a lot of trees around, you got to keep your trees trimmed. But so if the deputy would park in the right location, he'd certainly be able to do an activity without any problem. And I can Thanks. personally tell you from my own experience, I have maintained connectivity on an NMARSAT call. Uh, using a, an MRSAT Mini M, so this is about 20, uh, about probably about 15 years ago. We were doing 100 miles an hour on a German Autobahn, and we had the Mini M sitting on a box, looking out the driver or the rear driver's side window. We were driving north. The, uh, the terminal was looking out west, connected to the satellite, and we maintained connectivity at 100 miles an hour until we went through a tunnel. So uh, that was 20 years ago. Advances in Doppler shift mitigation for comms on the move has come a lot further since then. So I think that's definitely within the realm of the possible for a sheriff's deputy, both while he's mobile and once he gets out of the car with the right type of relay technology where his handheld can be tied to the car, then the car becomes the SATCOM node to get him the long haul back to, to the command post. Uh, thank you. That, that, that's really good to hear. I know uh, many of us in public safety, you know, our only experience with satellite is uh, in a disaster. Uh, you know, we're handed a, uh, in the old days, a very large uh, satellite phone to use, to use. And some of our experiences having, you know, rather large uh, dishes on some of our mobile command trailers to provide us with coverage. So it's great to hear about the, the evolution of this and uh, the thought that we can extend a lot of this mission-critical data capability to first responders who are out in very rural areas. Very good. Uh, Any other questions? If not, let me see. 
while we wait for other people to think about what they might like to ask, I had one other question. So this is for any of the panelists to answer. How can public safety agencies or state emergency management departments, where you know a lot of satellite is managed from and, and contracted through, gain, ac gain access to satellite bandwidth on an as-needed basis, kind of a just-in-time basis, just when the emergency occurs? Now, you know, could it be a maybe it's all of these? I don't know. Is it a, a flat rate monthly fee, and then you pay a premium for airtime when it's needed? Uh, can you guys talk to that based on your experience? Well, I'll kind of jump in and, and, and go first since being the operator. Um, so we have we have several things actually that work in an emergency situation, um, and a lot of other folks do this to global VSAT form. Other folks, uh, a lot of times, and we're doing it now as we speak, is you know, capacity is even being provided down in Puerto Puerto Rico for free. Um, we have some flyaway units. Uh, Luxembourg government is teamed with a um, couple of an air air service and then SCS for what they call Lux EU or emerging emergency LU, and basically they they fly a weird jet to where the emergency is, put up a couple of VSAT terminals, and then SCS provides the the capacity for free. Our fellow competitors at Geo do the same thing in emergencies, very similar capabilities. So true, true emergencies where there's a, a big disaster out there, um, you know, you just need to be able to have, be able to get access to the equipment that's out there, but a lot of times the capability is provided. And that longer term, um, as, as cleanups happen and extend on, um, we transition. We always keep a pool of bandwidth in, in a class of pool bandwidth that we call occasional use. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it really is for, um, satellite news gathering trucks, et cetera, like, like that. So when you see the trucks out there, you know, filming something like inside the road, and you see the little dish, uh, they're out, they're out of line of sight of their, uh, station, they, they're going to use a satellite link to come back. And so, um, those are usually folks that have already have prearranged contracts. They have access to our scheduling tools online, which is just an application. They go and say, Hey, I need 10 minutes of time. We tell them what satellite, what time they can start and what time they stop and, and off they go and they have a predetermined rate. You know, based on the, the the amount they use uh per year. Well, it sounds pretty flexible, Ken. Thanks. Either uh either uh, Russ or Chris, do you have any uh comments there? I know you're not satellite service providers, but thoughts on shared satellite bandwidth, maybe just from your experiences working with providers or other areas where you've had work experience in that regard? This, this is Chris. What I've seen is typically the long pole and the shent for that is, is having the equipment. You know, the, the bandwidth is usually there. The service providers providers are fairly flexible, uh, you know, and have capacity to take care of this. If not, they can free it up in, in times of emergency. The real question comes down to the hardware and is it positioned where it needs to be. Uh, a lot of times during natural disasters, we get called uh, from users, you know, wanting to know if we have equipment, can they buy the equipment, and Unfortunately, we typically don't keep it on the shelves, so uh, it's one of those things for the users, you know, you really need to think up front, be prepared, have the equipment, uh, and, you know, have training on it before, you know, the natural disaster or whatever disaster happens. Uh, that's probably the key thing that I've seen. No, that's, that's, that is key, yeah, planning and training, absolutely. And, and I will just, you know, make another statement that uh, this is something that you work during your disaster preparation activities, uh, working with your federal partners to see is there a way that you could get uh, potentially uh, federal funding to augment the cost of on-demand. Uh, as Chris said, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the companies out there, uh, you, you'll pay an annual subscription fee to have access to the terminal. And then it's uh, with a credit card you have uh, you, know, you pay for for by the minute use uh, when you need it. Uh, the key thing is really understanding what you have to uh, um, how to use it, how to point it, um, considerations about trees and things like that. So it's you definitely don't want it to be a pickup game the first time you go out into the field with it. No, that's a good point. And even with some of the easier self-acquiring systems, which, oh, by the way, are a little bit more expensive, too, it's always nice to have a level of training, just like first responders are trained in a lot of other aspects of their jobs. So 
All right. Well, I'm going to open it up one more time for questions. If not, I just have one question left, but I heard somebody chime in. Let me pause. Hey, 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 Gary, this is Bill Schreier. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you just fine, Bill. Hey, thank you so much for, for putting on this series of both last week and this week of satellite providers. It's been quite enlightening to me. Um, and you know, I really appreciate you, you, you bringing these folks up. The, um, I, and I, I had to step away for a moment during this call. The, uh, I did hear, uh, you asked the question, what relevance, uh, these, th these three folks had, uh, or thought their products had for FirstNet. And I also heard Barry Luke's question and comment about, uh, the handset connected to, say, a sheriff's deputy's car. But, but could you or one of your panelists repeat what you think the form factor, um, uh, for a, a satellite connected um, data device might be in the future. I saw the, 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 the set of slides that had to do with the large antennas and the trackable antennas for, for low Earth orbit, which concerned me a little bit if you've got to have a trackable antenna. Is it, is it possible, do you think, that, that, that we might have a, a, a form factor uh, in the shape of, um, oh, say, a land mobile radio, today's land mobile yeah, radios? No. Yeah, yeah let, me ch let me chime in there, uh, Bill, based on what I know, only from being out in the community and at a, a number of trade shows this year where I've learned a lot about what the advances that have been made. So some of the new Iridium handsets are very small. Now, those operate over a LEO satellite, and they're basically a service offered by what is Iridium Next, which is the next generation of uh, satellites that they've launched into low Earth orbit. Uh, so very small, very lightweight, nothing like the big phones I've seen before. So that's, you know, on the device side, and I'll let the folks chime in on other things that they've seen. I think there might have been some pictures that Russ had, but I don't know if those were just beacons or actually devices that you can talk and send data on. Um, the other is I was at Modern Day Marine down at Quantico Base in, in, uh, Virgi in uh, Virginia or in Maryland, and I saw some very small uh, NEO terminals. Uh, from SES. I don't know whose terminal they were, Tim, but I was there with uh, Jeff Winch, who I think you might know, and I was amazed at seeing something like this. The, the actual antenna, which was moving, was flat and it was about the size of a, of a tablet. So that, Bill, that's been my experience recently from, you know, going to some of these uh, events. I'll open it up to the other panelists to, to answer as well. Yeah, I was going to say, actually, if you just want to Google connected car satellite antenna, uh, you, there's a, uh, I did it while, we're, while Gary was talking, there's a link to Bill Gates' back to Meta, and they show their uh, flat panel antenna that they've already tested. It's a uh, 70-centimeter version of the antenna. Yeah, I've seen, I've actually seen the Kymeta demonstrated and certainly, you know, Bill, if you want to see one of these things, I can get you connected. But they, um, it's not a phased array though. I learned it's an electronic array. I don't know too much of the difference between others. I'm sure Russ and other guys may know the difference, but, uh, but yeah, no, it was, it's, it's just lays on your roof. Smaller than a car carrier. The electronically serable arrays, they're, uh, their name for them, so. And basically, the, okay. the, the advantage that that gives you is not only is it a flat form factor, so it it can sit on a car roof without creating a you know a huge drag issue uh, not, you know, like you would normally see with a dish. Uh, with these, uh, with Kymeta's technology, uh, which by the way they also have FCC authorization to produce these things, um, they can actually track two satellites at once. So for an O3B type architecture or you've got the satellite that you're talking to, it's going to fade from view in X number of, of minutes. And uh, with these flat panels, you would have the ability to acquire the next satellite that's coming over the horizon and have a seamless handover from one to the other uh, as, as, as the satellites move past. So that's one of the key enablers to that technology is that seamless transition from one satellite to the next for the user uh, um, side of it. Uh, and then I also wanted to comment on the form factor. Uh, there are uh, radio relays out there, so basically uh, you would have something that the deputy is accustomed to using that he would typically use on his person, uh, as, and he would talk back to his car, and then in the car you would have that connected to the SATCOM terminal. So he, when he was away from the car, 
you would be talking to the car, and then the car would make the relay to the SATCOM terminal, and it would go out. Uh, and then finally, the things that Gary mentioned, those, those radios that I had in my presentation, uh, those are the actual pictures of the handset themselves. Um, I'm a personal fan of the Shout Nano from NAL Research. Uh, it's about the size of a smartphone. Actually, it, it, it's the length and width of a smartphone, and it's the thickness of about two smartphones. And that gives you uh, text message capability uh, using the Iridium short burst data waveform, which does not cost nearly as much as uh, Iridium voice. So if all you wanted to do was keep track of where your units are in the field, uh, these these handsets will, will ping back to your network saying, here I am, and it'll give you your identification, the GPS location, and then he can also key in uh, either a brevity code or just send a message that uh, I've arrived at the, the location, investigating disturbance, whatever, uh, and then if he does get into trouble, they have a panic button or a distress button on the side. He lifts the cover, he, uh, cover, he pushes that button, and then everybody knows that he's in trouble and he needs help, and you can do a very quick response that way. Well, hey, Gary, that's that's a very helpful set of responses. Appreciate you going over it again. And, you know, certain things like the electronically steerable antennas, the ability to acquire multiple satellites, um, the, the short burst capability that, that we were just talking about, that's, that's all very helpful to me. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Bill. Um, I know we're right at the... Uh, ending point. Um, I don't know if we want to open it up for one more question. I'll leave that up to Barry and Kim, or we can wrap it up here. Uh, I think Gary will go ahead and wrap it up. Um, okay. I do. I do want to thank Chris and Russ and Tim for their time today. Uh, we really appreciate it, and this has uh, been invaluable information. I think as Bill just stated. So. Um, Gary, I want to give an extra special thanks to you for um, your participation in the past two weeks and, frankly, setting up the entire panel thing, um, uh, panel presentation, excuse me, um, providing this opportunity for public safety and the other NIPSTIC stakeholders to um, hear about this really important technology. So I think it is going to be transforming, especially in those areas where um, the network is a challenge, but first responders still have to go. So so thanks, everybody, for their time. And again, thanks to the panelists and to Gary. And we hope you have a good day.